the world's largest underground pedestrian network, Toronto Path. G'day guys, how's it going? My name is Ozzy Tash. This particular video was suggested to me by one of my members on Discord. Shout out to Cam Seba. I love all your suggestions, mate. I'm really, really looking forward to this video. Is this sort of similar to Rezo in Montreal? Who knows? Let's get into it. The world's largest underground pedestrian network, the Toronto Path. Let's roll. What if I told you that if you lived here in Toronto, you could go through the entire winter without ever having to go outside? That's thanks to the Toronto Path Network, the world's largest underground pedestrian path network thing. <laughs> you might call it a mall, you might call it a pedestrian network. Let's just call it the path. The path is an incredible thing that connects to a lot of transit facilities, different destinations, and everything in between. But the question is, should more cities build things like it? Let's look at the path and talk about that. So to be perfectly clear, the Toronto Path is an underground network that connects the downtown financial oh core of Toronto with various subway stations, office buildings, malls, tourist attractions, stadiums, all kinds of different stuff what? all connected to this pedestrian network. Now the network this is, is like over that one 30 in Montreal. kilometers long and it's not just this barren wasteland, it has over a thousand shops and services throughout it. It feels a lot like a mall, but maybe a bit more cramped. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the transit connections to the path are really impressive. There are six different subway stations on the Young University Spadina line, the U-shaped line that goes through downtown Toronto, that connect directly to the path. Basically, okay. you exit the subway station and you're directly inside a building, underground. The path network is also connected to Toronto Union Station, from which you can go to the airport, meaning that yes, oh, you can wow. land in Toronto, get on an airport train, go see a Toronto Maple Leafs game, stay in your hotel, go to some tourist attractions, and head back to uh, wherever you traveled from without ever having to step outside. And that's actually pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Especially in a city that has, again, harsh winters yeah, and really, look at that. really muggy hot <laughs> summers. There's also, of course, national rail service and regional rail service from Go Transit, as well as the new indoor Union Station bus terminal. So there is a ton of different indoor transit offerings in the downtown Toronto core. Now, what I think is so amazing about the Toronto Path, and something that I think we really need to think about more, is how it helps transit compete better with private cars. If it's the middle of winter in Toronto, it can be attractive to get in a car just so that you don't have to walk from, say, your bus stop or your streetcar stop or the subway station to your final destination. But this is where the path comes in. Once you're coming into downtown Toronto, likely on the subway, but possibly on a streetcar, it's at most a short walk to the nearest building to get underground and to have access to basically the entire downtown core and most yeah, of the places cool. you'd want to go yeah. without having to step outside. Okay, so let's talk about it for a second. Let's talk about the winters. I'm not sure about the winters in Toronto. Does it snow there? Does it snow there hard? Um, you know, three months of constant, constant snow in the winter. Jump on, let me know if you guys live in Toronto. Also, these harsh summers. <laughs> I love how you guys harsh summers. I know I'm whinging about the winter and how cold it is here in Australia. It's probably about 11 or 12 degrees and I'm all rugged up and I say it's freezing, it's freezing. And you guys all say, oh, mate, Tash, you've got no idea what you're talking about. Clearly, I don't. No, I don't see the snow. It doesn't get that cold here. I'm just a whinger. But summers, man, I bet we can trump you on summers. Harsh summers here. Every summer here is absolutely disgusting. It's like 30 degrees plus, and then you've got the humidity on top of that, and all you want to do is stay inside. You just don't want to go outside. The minute you walk outside, you're passing out, mate. That's just how it goes. The humidity in Queensland summers is absolutely disgusting. Would something like this be really, really cool in Brisbane City? Absolutely. Will they do it? No chance. Never going to happen. We've got the Olympics coming up in 2032 in Brisbane. She wants to do some crazy stuff, our Premier Anastasia Palisade. Eh? Nothing cool like this, but maybe you guys need to get in touch with her and show her how it's done. All right, let's keep on going. In the same way that if you're driving a car, you'd be able to drive straight to the building this you want to go to, get into the parkade, <laughs> and never have to step out into rain or snow or extreme heat, you can ride transit and directly get to the destination you want to get to, mm. even if your trip requires a short walk at the end of it through the PATH network. Now, there are a ton of interesting features to the PATH. 
One of them is the way that it's so frequented by office workers. Now, in university, I spent a summer as an office working intern, and it was amazing the ability you had to access all kinds of different food options, oh, yeah, different be cool, services, man. and the like, without even having to leave your building, which was really nice when it was incredibly hot out. Especially during inclement weather, the path really fills up, though it has been less busy during COVID-19. What oh, I yes. compare it to is Nothing kind of a giant COVID -19. mall, sort of like the pedestrian malls you sometimes see connected to subway stations in other cities, mm -hmm. but just on an entirely different scale. And in fact, there's even residential buildings now that connect up to the path. And what this That's means like is that, that you can literally go back to your apartment, yeah. sleep, wake up, walk over to your office building in the morning without ever having to step outside. And while this might sound a little weird and miserable if you're the outdoorsy type, in Toronto during winter, especially when the snow actually <laughs> starts to melt, you will appreciate it. Yeah. One of the coolest things for me when I lived in a building that was attached to the path was being able to go downtown and go to the mall without ever having to put a jacket on in the middle of winter. Yeah, that's that was cool. really cool. That is and cool. And there's an important point to make there, which is that the in-body transfers that Toronto has where you can easily transfer from a bus or a streetcar onto the subway network, in many cases without having to go outside or at least get wet or covered yeah. in snow if it's snowing or raining, are really cool because what they mean is that the second you get onto your transit vehicle in the morning, you don't have to worry about wearing your jacket or about getting soaked or covered in snow for the rest of the day because you'll be able to access your subway station without going outside in many cases, and you'll be able to access your final destination, be it an office or a concert downtown, again, without having to go outside. It's really cool. It does sound really, really cool. My question that I have is how much does it cost to live in an apartment building or a residential building that connects to the path. Do you rent them? Do you own them? I'm guessing lots of office workers might live in some of these buildings, but I'm guessing it wouldn't be cheap because you're located right in the middle of the center. You've got all that convenience. You've got the path. You can, you know, walk from home to work, not get wet, not get hot, you know, all the perks. You can get coffees. I've seen a H&M there. I'm guessing there's going to be heaps of food. You've got access to stadiums, airport, all that sort of stuff. You don't even have to go outside at all. Um, I'm guessing it's going to be very, very expensive to live in these residential buildings that are accessible from the path. Guys, if you live there or you know someone that lives there, jump on, tell me all about it. I love to hear the prices. If you want to live in Brisbane City in something like that, you know, the CDB we call it, <laughs> mate, I'd have no idea how much it was cost and I don't want to know. It would be some crazy, crazy, crazy million dollar plus, you know, for a little one bedroom apartment with a small cramped toilet, I reckon. <laughs> I think we call them studio apartments. But yeah, you don't want to live in Brisbane. We don't have anything cool like this. There is just traffic and congestion and a big long brown lake. That's it. <laughs> all right, this is a really, really cool story. I'm absolutely loving this. I'm loving all the facilities and the convenience of it. It's just so cool. He mentioned you can get to concerts and stadiums and stuff like that. Can you get to a Maple Leafs game? I'm not quite too sure. Let's find out. To be clear, not the entire path is underground, and newer sections are a lot nicer than older sections. Mm -hmm. The sections in the Toronto waterfront, mostly south of Union Station, are actually mostly elevated, which is a cool change of scenery. Oh, look at it that! It lets you That's get cool. really good views of the different city streets oh, and some less Toronto. nice areas as well. And the <laughs> path isn't staying still. New developments like CIBC Square, which is the location of the Union Station bus terminal, are connecting up to the network to further expand it. And that's mm -hmm. actually how the path largely developed. When a plot of land got developed to build an office tower, it was basically organized to link up to the adjacent path system and provide links to future adjacent plots. This okay. way, most of the time when you see a major new development in downtown Toronto that's anywhere near the path, you see some sort of connection and expansion of the system. It's sort of decentralized in that way. Now to give you a sense of the scale of the path, you can walk for 40 minutes to an hour entirely within it, just walking from one end to the other. The okay. southernmost end is around the waterfront, while the northernmost end is oh, north what of the Toronto here? Eaton Centre, which is the massive downtown Toronto mall that's actually quite nice. Now, hmm. among Torontonians, the path is really famous for being confusing. But honestly, I don't think it's that bad. What can be confusing is that when you're within a single building, there tends to be a ton of different corridors, sometimes multiple levels, 
and it's a little disorientating. Mm -hmm. But once you have a general sense of what building you're located in and the cardinal directions, you can generally find your way to wherever you need to go by just say going east if you need to go east and going west if you need to go west. I also have to say that wayfinding has improved significantly even since I've moved to Toronto with much better maps and more clear signs being available widely in the network. This was a previous issue because as I mentioned before, since the system was sort of decentralized, you didn't have a great single unified wayfinding system. Now to be totally clear, the PATH network is far from perfect and I actually wish it extended much further. In particular, to the northwest it's sort of lacking. Uh, the PATH network kind of extends to the northeast side of downtown, but not the hospitals in particular at the northwest. Oh, that's I think not really good, is it? them yeah. would be fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, to be clear though, you can access the hospitals, just not necessarily by walking. You'd have to get on the subway and then get off at a station that's, that's adjacent to them. And then you can usually walk to the hospitals indoors. It would be nicer if you could just walk the whole way indoors, especially since if you're coming in from say a regional train, that would mean getting on a subway train and with our current fare scheme, paying an extra fare. It's very silly. There's also a weird sort of missing link where there's a bunch of buildings northwest of Union Station and a bunch of stuff southwest of Union Station that aren't connected across Front Street. And a connection across Front Street would be oh so nice for improving connectivity in the western part of the network. Okay, I really have no idea what he's talking about here, guys. Jump on, give me some clarity. Um, he did mention that you can't get to the hospitals from the path. Mate, you jump on a train, get to a hospital. Uh, we can't get to a hospital on a train. The closest hospital I am here, I can't get, get to there by a train. I think I'd have to catch like two or three buses. <laughs> and the hospital is just so small and so overcrowded. Don't even get me started on the health system in Australia. I know it's free and we should be happy that it's free, but it's an absolute mess. I'm pretty sure Canada are having similar problems with their free healthcare system as well. It is, it is a mess, but it's also free. So that's something that we should be thankful for. But yeah, there is lots of kinks in the system. You know, they say they're going to fix them. They do try to fix them. I do believe that they're trying to fix them. But yeah, it's, gonna, it's just going to keep on going and going and going. The next question that I have is this place is so big. I'm going to download a map later and have a look at it. What's the crime rate like in the path? Like, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning, people walking through there. What are your chances of getting mugged? I'm guessing the, the surveillance and the cameras would be like high tech. You know, it's 24-7, so there's going to be cameras everywhere. But yeah, what are your chances of getting mugged at those ATMs? I said like a line of ATMs that was like seven or eight in a row. What What's the crime rate there? Guys, jump on. If you're local there or you know, let me know. Now, one of the worst missing links in the network is literally directly northwest from Union Station. But interestingly, this is the first publicly owned section of the PATH network that was built by the city of Toronto, who now organizes the network in general, but doesn't necessarily construct it. It's, again, decentralized. Uh, this short section connects Union Station across Front Street, but doesn't go further. And so a further extension of it would be absolutely amazing for providing better connectivity overall. What's perhaps even more interesting is that not only Toronto, but Montreal also has a similar network yeah. to the past called the Reso. The what Rezo, this means yeah. is that depending on where you live, you could travel onto the subway to Union Station in Toronto, across to Montreal in a different province, and then yeah. get off your train, go to say a Montreal Canadiens game, stay in a hotel, and travel back to Toronto to your home, again, without ever having to go outside. And I think that's pretty cool. Again, that because is pretty cool. winters are rough, especially in Montreal. I'll probably get comments if I don't mention it, but Calgary also has a similar system to the path and the okay. race. Though. But it's called the Plus 15 and it's actually above ground. And I'm going to be honest, I think Calgary's system is a lot better. For one, you get nice views of the streets and it sort of makes it feel a little less hollow than the path, which in some places feels kind of dark and dingy. The yeah. other nice thing about the Plus 15 is that when you want to build new subway lines, you don't have to interact with all of these underground tunnels, which can allow for cut and cover subways. Right, Calgary? Right, Calgary? Uh, uh, now, to be clear, the path does have funny? some major I'm problems. I'm not quite too sure. One thing that is incredibly frustrating is that the network is often at different levels from building to building, which means that to cross from one building to another, you often have to go up an escalator or sometimes, though That's rarely, right, a set mate. of stairs. Seriously. Uh, this is inconvenient for most people, but it makes it a bit of an accessibility nightmare for those who are less able. <laughs> And that's really frustrating yeah, that's because probably, yeah. in a lot of cases, the accessible solution was sort of retrofitted in and that often includes a really long ramp 
or kind of inconvenient elevator or lift. And so the different levels, not the greatest thing. Mate, how come your escalators are the step ones? Why aren't they just the flat ones so the wheelchairs can just go on up there? We don't see many of the stair ones here in Australia now. Um, they're more just the flat ones. So they don't have the different step levels. So you can just, you know, people with wheelchairs or, you know, um, mobility scooters and stuff like that, they can just, you know, ride on up there. Um, you need to phase out those step ones. Uh, jump on, leave me a comment. Because then they've just got to build a, a big elevator. And if the elevator breaks, then, mate, what's going to happen? In Australia, I think we have both, like, they, they, they provide both the options for a lot of the newer places anyway. And I'm pretty sure I've seen a lot of the step ones being pulled down. The last time I was at um, the Brisbane International Airport and stuff like that, they're all just the long flat ones. The step ones just don't exist anymore. So, yeah, you probably should get rid of that and, you know, upgrade to just the flat ones. Don't have a whinge about, you know, it's inconvenient to have to, you know, jump on an escalator or an elevator and go up another level to, to a place that you need to get to. Mate, it's better than being outside walking in the freezing cold or the hot, <laughs> the horrible heat. <laughs> um, this is a really cool video. I love for Brisbane City to embrace something like this, but like I said, it's never going to. It just keeps on building up and up and up and up and oh, like I said, it's not the prettiest city. Um, I'm more of a Sydney fan myself. I love Sydney, New South Wales. But yeah, Brisbane City itself, it's not really the prettiest city, guys. If you want, you know, all the views in Queensland and stuff, you go down to Surface Paradise. That's where you see the beaches and you see all the glitz and the glamour. They call it Hollywood on the Gold Coast. Brisbane City, it doesn't have a beach. It's got like a big brown lake and that's about it. All right, let's keep on going. Another problem, and this kind of stems from the decentralized nature of its development, is that the path is not super consistent. To be fair, the wayfinding is, yes, finally consistent, but the design of the interiors of the spaces aren't. And what this means is that you can go from a really nice building to a less nice building, and you don't yeah, really have right. consistency. Uh, since these are individual buildings as well, there's often doors in between them, despite the fact that you're entirely underground. Yeah. And that's also annoying. I believe it's for climate control reasons. Maybe one building wants to have more heat than another and they don't want to pay for heating for the other building. Very frustrating. I think the way to solve this in the future is to have the city implement more standards so that they say, if you want to develop and connect to the path, you have to design to this standard. I'm not sure if we'll see that, but if we do, that would be pretty cool. Makes sense, now, one thing that yeah. is nice about the path is that unlike some other indoor pedestrian networks and malls and the like that you see in cities, it has really wide open opening hours. And that means that even if all of the shops around you and the offices above you are closed, you can still utilize the network to get from, say, a sports game to a local location connected somewhere. And that's okay. something that's really useful because it means that people are comfortable walking from different locations downtown to others, even late at night, because the network is pretty secure, well lit, and the like. That said, there is always a major debate about the path, about the Plus 15 in Calgary, and about other networks like this. The question is, is it good to take all of the pedestrians off of the streets, and let's be honest, not everyone is going to use the path, and have streets that are maybe a bit more dead and maybe a bit more mm. car-oriented because there are less pedestrians on them? Well, I would say yes and yes. The truth is we do need more pedestrian space on our streets. We desperately need it. But I don't think there's anything wrong with having these underground or above ground I think they're pretty cool, that eh? make being a pedestrian, cyclist, or transit user in a city much more convenient. Mm -hmm. I think a similar situation exists for light rail and better streets. Uh, often people act as if you need to have light rail on a street to redesign it, when the truth is you can easily redesign a street with a subway under it too. Yeah. I think that's what we really need to be thinking about. How do we make our cities more pedestrian and people oriented and less car oriented? And it doesn't mean not having underground paths. Well, there you go. The world's largest underground pedestrian network, the Toronto Path. Is it true? Is it the world's largest underground? Is that some Guinness World Record that it's got going there? All in all, it's really, really cool. I love it. There's two of these in Canada that I know about, and he talked about one in Calgary. I'll have to look at the one in Calgary. But yeah, I think it's really, really cool. This sort of stuff would be awesome if they bring this to Australia. 
At Sydney, I know that there's a little bit of an underground network, but it doesn't span like this. This is really, really cool. It just hooks you up with so much cool stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. In Australia, I think it's all just keep on building higher and higher and higher or just keep on extending it and extending it and extending it. Man, the place I'm living at, my very, very home now, when I was a kid, it was a potato farm. <laughs> now it's my home. <laughs> Um, I absolutely love this video. I love learning about stuff like this. It's really, really exciting. All right, that was the video for today, guys. If you enjoyed it, please jump on, smash the like button, leave a comment, and of course, remember to subscribe. That really helps me out. Also, guys, jump on. Do you live in Toronto? Do you like the path? Do you use the path frequently in summer and in winter? Um, what's the cost of living like around that area? I'm guessing it'd be pretty high because you've, you've got a real convenient thing happening there with this path, haven't you? All right. Cheers to Nananda. Take care. Bye.